All right, so welcome to this um, welcome to this Archer for a tutorial. Um, so this tutorial is going to be about version control. It's going to be quite um, quite a simple low level introduction. So really the idea of this, this tutorial is that for if you've never used version control before, if you've vaguely heard about it, that you've perhaps heard people say, oh, you really should be putting this under revision control, revision control, or um, how come you've got so many files lying around, why isn't this properly documented, or so if you're simply curious uh, what version control, control is all about, then um, this is a virtual tutorial for you. So it's going to be just um, an introduction, really, to what it's all about, to give you some idea of how you could use version control and um, in your work and on your projects and how to do so. So I of this, uh, this talk is um, first we're just going to talk about what the problem really is. I mean, why do we need version control? And it turns out that many of us, uh, what we do or what, what people generally do, um, if you're dealing with, with files, be it software, source code, programming, or documents, uh, we often uh, are quite sloppy with these. <laughs> and that can be all right if it's just a small project, if it's just a couple of things here or there. But um, over time, this can really get, get you into trouble. And it can really, what seems to save you time in the beginning, can, lead, can end up leading to um, confusion, um, possibly retracted papers if you publish some results that uh, are based on on code that you that wasn't actually the code that you thought it was based on, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we'll, we'll first look about first look at what the problem really is. Uh, then we'll give a quick outline about about version control, basic idea, some basic concepts, um, some basic terminology, just so we can get rolling. Um, and then I'll talk a bit about some popular or at least common, commonly used version control systems. Uh, so these are tools that we can use, such as SVN, uh, CVS, and Git, which you may have heard of, you may not have heard of. So we can use these to uh, partly automate some of the things that um, version control promises to do. So I'll do a practical demonstration, and um, so you'll get a sense for how this how this thing works. It'll be a, it won't be a kind of oh this is magical. Uh, so you simply do this and that. Uh, it'll be a simple simple demonstration, but hopefully it'll give you an impression of what it's like to really use these things, um, including some of the some of the quirks, some of the gotchas, some of the things that you have to keep in mind um, when you're actually sitting down thinking about using these tools. And hopefully that should give you an idea for um, whether you might want to use these tools or not. So what's the problem? Well, let's just think of the following example. I mean, you might have, you might have encountered something similar. So you've got some, some script uh, that you're using to, for example, do a little calculation or do some data analysis or whatever it is. It doesn't even have to be some, uh, some research. It can be something, 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 something simple. It can even be just a file that uh, has some configuration settings for, uh, for your software environment on your machine, et cetera. So that could be your language of choice, MATLAB or Python. Um, so you've got a working version. Great. So this is version zero. Now, you want to do some new stuff. So you introduce some new function functionality um, by making changes to that version zero, to that script. But you know that um, you're quite likely to break something in the process. And anyway, while you're still writing the new code, um, it's quite likely, well, while you're writing the new code, the script isn't going to work. And you might still want to continue using it in the functional form before you've got the new version. So what you do is you make a copy, right? So you create a new, you create a new copy, and you start editing the new copy, keeping the old copy, keeping version zero to do its job while you're working on version one, which is going to be the new fantastic thing that you want to implement. OK, fine. So version one, if you implement it, your new, your new thing. Version one works. Great. But it works on your own laptop. So 
then you transfer version one to a different machine, for example, Archer, uh, to do some to do some stuff with it there to do this great new thing on that other machine. But it doesn't work. It breaks. Why? Oh yeah, you forgot about this or that. Um, your script wasn't completely general, so you need to take into account the fact that on this machine things are set up slightly differently. So okay, you better you better tweak that. You better change make those changes. So that leads to a new version again, uh, version two, uh, which is actually version three. Okay, I'm using array index or version index starting at zero. Yes, so version two is actually version three. <laughs> so you've got three versions. Uh, so you go back to the original copy thinking that oh, actually you want to do some, um, uh, you've got a new idea for implementing the same functionality but in a different, faster way. Uh, so basically you, you do the same thing, you keep version 0 to make another copy and um, change that, implementing the same functionality as in version 1 uh, but in a different way. You transfer that across to the machine, etc. So what you see what's happening is that you've got this massive proliferation of versions. Now, is that a problem? Maybe not. Maybe you've got photographic memory and maybe you know exactly what's where and um, you will continue down the line six months later when you next use these scripts. Uh, you'll remember exactly what each script did um, and you'll know exactly which one to use. That's great, but um, typically um, having multiple versions of of files, that is having having a lot of files, multiple copies of files, where there is content in the file that's common, uh, so a lot of overlap, um, but it's just some small differences, um, is, very, is, is quite unmanageable. It becomes unmanageable because um, when you want to uh, make develop the code further, you have to decide, oh, uh, what am I going to use? Which version am I going to use? And you have to try and remember exactly uh, which changes you made where and what you need to integrate uh, into your new version. So basically, unless you literally remember every single thing and you, without making any mistakes, <laughs> copy and paste <laughs> manually the right parts of the right files into the new file, um, then, uh, so unless you can do that, then this, this is can be problematic. Um, at the very least, it's inefficient, and it's quite likely to be error prone. I mean, we will probably have a case where um, we suddenly realize oops, we've, for example, submitted a number of jobs to, to a, a cluster like, like a supercomputer like Archer, and then you realize after it's run and you've used the whole cycles that, oh, actually, uh, it was the wrong version that was running. It wasn't the version that the new tweak, so that's why it failed and crashed, etc. So one more thing to say is that one of the ways we first, one of the ways we get around um, the problem of having multiple versions of files is, is is we give them all kinds of intricate file names. We basically overload the file name to contain all this information, which of course, unless we have photographic memory, we won't remember. So typically, you'll have uh, file names saying, for example, the date and maybe the, the sources and data, and then um, the, uh, the the new feature that you implemented, and they might say, oh, in brackets, latest. And then you have another version which says latest, latest, and another version which says doesn't work, try, test, etc. So, so far what I've said, the problem with having multiple versions um, uh, files just is just with regards to doing your own development by yourself, purely your own, um, your own work, uh, nobody else. But Working in this way can also be problematic, or having multiple files can also be problematic, multiple versions of files can also be problematic when you're working in a team. So um, it doesn't even need, need to be a software development, although that is one of the primary use cases for these version control systems. It can also be if you're working on um, a joint article for publication, or if you're working on some other kind of, some other kind of documentation, some text that um, is, 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 is a commutal product that you need to um, produced together and it's being edited um, individually and ideally at the same time by multiple authors. So, so the point being that, I mean, um, the changes that people make need to be shared amongst team members and 
there needs to be some way to integrate all these changes into, um, say, a final version or an approved version or in any way, and these changes need to be integrated. So the way that you might, might do this um, sort of uh, naively is uh, if you're working on an article, for example, a publication where it might be you, it might be a, a senior supervisor, it might be one or two collaborators. So you want to, you want to have a go. Um, you, might, you, might have them, you might use the model uh, of um, write, a write token. So basically you say, okay, right now you're the only person editing the file. So uh, you go ahead, you make a first, have a first tab at it, you write this section, then email us the draft, the draft that you've come up with. And then, um, and then this person will have a go, and that person will have a go, kind of round robin, and um, the email, so then you'll, you'll, you'll typically email or, or these files or put them in a, in a, in a shared folder, that you can also do that. But it's, it's quite, um, quite involved, and in particular, what that way of working means is that you cannot easily work on the same file at the same time. Now, um, if you're working on the same file in different sections, that's fine. You see, you do the introduction, I'll work a bit on, on uh, theory, and you work a bit on uh, results, and you work on methodology, that's fine. But if it's, if it's um, especially if it's, if it's sort of source code, and um, if it's very interconnected, then uh, you're it's, it would just be a bad idea because if you manually, if you, if three of you work on some software, some code, go off by yourselves and each of you does some stuff, then disentangling the relations that you've probably created and just only doing a bit of work is a bit of a nightmare. Doing that manually is going to be very complicated. And, um, uh, error prone as well to come up with the final version. So also, okay, so I've talked about the um, one way that you can come up, go around, get around the um, problem of multiple versions and just have a file locking or have a write token. So you want, you want to, ideally you want to keep track of who made which changes as well uh, and why. So one of the things that file names are often used for, as I said, is um, the kind of changes that have been made, for example, this new feature or that new feature, but um, the file often you might also put in the file and some some hint as to um, why you made this change. Um, so really, what you want is you want some way of of doing this more efficiently, more systematically, uh, more automated, and therefore less error prone. So version control. Uh, and particular version control systems are a way to do this. So version control systems uh, are, say, formalized models and, and also tools, software tools, just things that you can use to take a lot of the um, error prone, uh, say, dirty work <laughs> out, of, uh, out of your hands and out of your collaborators' hands. Um, so what they do, what allow you to, what version control tools allow you to, to do is to keep track of the changes that uh, your work undergoes um, without having to uh, keep all these different files. It's a way of, uh, in a way, snapshotting your development history. Uh, and it's a way of tracking uh, who made which changes. And, uh, and all these things uh, it allows you to maintain multiple versions or variants of code. Uh, the snapshotting means that you have a historical record uh, of the state of your file. Um, typically, these version, the way these version control tools work, it's not like it's not like you press record and it's continuously recording everything, every all the changes you make. You choose you choose when to make when, when to take the snapshots. So you say at this point in time, okay, I've done a bit of work. Um, now this is going to be a snapshot or record this, and we'll, we'll see in the demonstration how to actually do that. So these provide this, this me these mechanisms provide a safety net because you can always go back and recover previous versions. Um, so you don't have to worry about uh, about um, deleting things. I mean, I say that, but I mean, of course, there's a limit. I mean, it's uh, um, version control systems do offer you a way to back up your, your file, your files, and your data. Uh, they don't automatically 
do so, but we'll see that. Um, pressure control systems also, so what they, what they do is they facilitate reproducible research in open science. And what I mean by that is that by systematizing the way that we uh, track um, the particulars software development, um, although there are also cases in, in, in the legal professions and other professions where legal documents are, are also tracked and then the way they are changed, so who's responsible for the changes is tracked. But what this does in, for software, and in particular for scientific uh, software, is that you can, with version control systems, you can say exactly which version of the code you use, for example, to uh, run a simulation that produces certain output results, and then you can say also exactly which version of the scripts you used to analyze that data, analyze, analyze those results, and then you and, and you know and put those in a publication. So um, what it's doing is if if you so actually what what these tools allow you to do is to to publicly state um, in a very convenient way this is um, the version of my software that I used, and if you make this your um, your, software, your files publicly available in a way that in ways that we will see, um, then it allows other others uh, in the scientific community to uh, verify to validate uh, your results in principle, because they should in principle be able to just simply download your code, um, rerun your your simulations, um, and reproduce your results. It also makes testing and development easier because it allows you to keep track of, uh, and, and this is one of the big reasons why uh, version control systems were originally, originally developed in, in industry, in, in um, um, programming, programming in general, and uh, in general software development, not for scientific software necessarily, just to uh, allow um, for projects that we're working on integrating new features, for example, new versions of operating systems, new versions of uh, like a media player or whatever application you might, you might think about to, to, to test whether there's any bugs, to fix these bugs, and at the same time to produce um, versions for different, um, to, for, to deploy these versions on different platforms. For example, you might have a version of a media player that works on Windows and also works on, on, on Linux and also works on OS X. So, um, Said there are a number of different version control systems, and we'll talk in a bit more detail in a bit, um, about what some of these are. But before we do that, there are some basic concepts in terminology that are good to to just um, clarify. So there's a lot there's a lot of terminology in in uh, the version control sort of world that's a bit quirky and and, um, and, and, and jargon that's unique to a particular tool like. CVS like SVN like it say, but some terms are quite general and are, are basically um, uh, present in some in some form, recognizable form in all these systems. So the crucial term is a repository. So the a repository is a complete archive uh, of all the versions of all the files that you chose, that you or other authors chose to be recorded, including all this additional valuable metadata about files, namely how they are related, by which I mean um, which, what changes led from one version of the file to another version of the file. And in fact, the way these version control systems store files is that they don't um, keep multiple, they don't keep uh, the copies of the same material over and over, and over again. They record differences in the as they record the changes that are being made um, from one version of the file to the next, which is, of course, more efficient than storing the, uh, the entire, um, reproducing the entire data, storing the entire data at each, for each version. So the notion of a repository is just, that's where everything lives, basically. So for a project, you might have one repository that contains all your, all your source code. The working copy is a concept that, um, so the working copy is, uh, okay, so it's a set of all files that are currently there in the directory where you're working with the repository. 
So we'll see how this concretely, uh, what I mean by this um, in the demonstration. But basically, whatever you have right now in a particular directory on your machine, that's your working copy. Now that might not have been recorded. You might just be in the middle of changing something. So that, that working copy is different from the version well, it's different from the repository. You have a working copy of the, of the repository. So the working copy is a copy of the repository which you are working on. And once you've made some changes that you think are suitable for going into the repository, then you can choose to record these in the repository. This is what we call a commit, as you'll see. So as I said, typically, typically the working copy differs from um, the a version, say typically the latest version in the repository, only by some only by those changes that you have made uh, to some files. There's typically a log, so a repository includes a log um, which records the history. It's basically a, a log of all the changes that were made to the repository and uh, by whom. And crucially also, uh, all these valuable comments by the authors um, who made the changes. This, this is where, um, so, so, so when you make, when you put new versions of files in a repository, you are strongly encouraged, in some cases forced <laughs> by these systems, but you're anyway strongly encouraged to provide comments on uh, stating why you made these changes and basically to summarize them. This means that at a glance, you can then uh, look over the log uh, from six months from now, year from now, whatever, and see uh, what all the changes for and see what the history was. I said already, one of the other notions, basic notions, is a commit. So a commit, uh, or the act of committing, means that you are basically creating a snapshot of a particular choice of files that are currently in your working copy and recording them, um, recording them in the repository as a version also. And the version is also referred to as a commit. So it's a bit weird. You've got two commits. You're committing them into the repository. You've got a commit, which is just, you know, the, the, all the contents, all the changes that you've chosen to um, that, that constitute that version. Now, branch, um, we won't go that much, even, although branching is, is extremely important in, in version control, um, we won't go very much into it um, because really we're just, we're, just, we're just looking at, at the very, very basics here. But Branches are a way of organizing your um, your repository in such a way that you can have, say, multiple streams of development. So what that means is that starting from a common ancestor, say, starting from a common working copy, you might explore different directions of development. And each of these directions, so each of these sort of streams of development, will have a, a number of different versions over time as the as development progresses along that direction. So for example, one, one, um, one branch might constitute uh, adding a, the, the, all the progress in adding a particular new feature to your existing software. Different, a different branch might constitute um, all the work that is done over time in uh, improving the uh, how fast uh, your software runs via whatever means, for example, parallelization. So now let's let's um, actually get down to a bit of nitty gritty. Let's make this. This is quite sort of, sort of general. Um, so let's get down to some concrete, um, useful stuff. Hopefully, so there. Are, we're gonna, I'm going to talk about three common uh, open source version control systems or tools. First one is CVS, which stands for Concurrent Versioning System. This is very old, well, I'll say very old. It's, I think it was established in the late 80s. Um, it's, it's very mature. It's, doesn't, it's not changing much for it anymore. It's not, it's not as popular as it used to be. And it's, it's fairly simple. Um, there's SVN. Um, it's actually uh, also referred to as Subversion. 
it's in a sense a successor or improved version of, of um, improvement to CVS. It's uh, more flexible and efficient than CVS, and it can also handle non-text files. So one thing I should say is that I've talked so far about, about software and about, about articles, documents. So I hesitate to say documents because the thing is with um, so what these version control systems allow you to do is not only to snapshot your history. As I said earlier, when you're collaborating with other people, these systems also allow you to integrate the changes that have been made to the, to the files. Now, however, they can only do so essentially in a meaningful way with um, plain text or with, with files that don't contain much um, other than, than plain text. Uh, this, so if you have, for example, a Microsoft Word document or, or a picture, then at the moment you can't expect, I mean, there might be some exotic variants of version control systems out there, but at the moment you can't expect the most, most widely used ones to deal with these files in a meaningful way, and they therefore will not give you the full features and full functionality of being able to cleverly integrate the changes made by different people with, for example, Microsoft Word files, uh, or, or pictures, so it's not, these systems aren't clever enough to, to do that. Um, but with essentially plain text format, uh, so, so software and uh, articles, they can be very useful. So the reason I mention that is that um, they can, of course I've said they, they can't in, in do these clever integrations, but they can, these systems can simply uh, snapshot these, um, uh, these other files binary files. Um, it's just that the way in which they do so can be either more or less efficient it's with CVS uh, being quite inefficient uh, because it, what it does with binary files, it actually stores um, individual copies each time. It stores every time you commit uh, a copy of the file, it stores that copy. It's not clever enough to look at the differences, whereas SVN is clever enough to look at the differences. So it's a lot more efficient in terms of space, storage space, and also in terms of uh, speed um, in dealing with non-text files. Uh, the third uh, common version control system, which I'll talk about today, is Skit. It is relatively new compared to CVS and SVN. Um, it's faster in a lot of cases. It has a lot of very powerful features, and it's really quite popular. Um, and it's used in a lot of new software development projects. So a couple of a couple of things before we start to actually use these systems, these tools, is to say a bit about the way that repositories are treated. And so this is a, this is useful to know because it makes it a bit clearer what you're actually doing, what's actually happening. Otherwise, it can be quite mystifying what's what's going on, especially if you use, um, for example, CVS or SVN, and you're used to the way that works and then you use a different tool like, like Git. So, so it's good to clarify uh, the way that, that these tools think about repositories, so the repository model, in other words. So CVS and SVN follow a centralized repository model. So basically the idea here is that there's a canonical sort of master repository that contains all of the most complete, up-to-date versions of files, and these are typically stored on a central server. So this repository is expected to, so the repository lives on the server. It lives from the point of view of any of its authors, unless they're literally not onto the server. It, li um, it lives remotely. So it doesn't live on their own machine. It lives remotely on the server. So when you are working with uh, the files in, the in, in a centralized repository using CBS or SVN, then what you do is you check out uh, a working copy of the repository to your local machine. You make changes, and then if you want to, do, if you want those changes to go back into the, uh, the repository, then those have to be uploaded to the server um, and committed to the repository as a new version. So that's distinct from the repository model used in, for example, Git, and also uh, another version control tool called Mercurial where um, 
the, the, there's no notion of a canonical central repository. You can have repositories that live on your machine. In fact, in SVN, you, SVN strictly speaking, you can also have that, but um, still the, the model is that um, uh, your repository is, is, um, lives somewhere remotely. So this is known as the distributed model. So getting mercurial, mercurial are known as distributed virtual control systems. Um, it means that there's no need to synchronize with a remote repository, no need to be connected to a server. But the obvious benefit of this is um, that you can just work on the go. And then before the era of uh, ubiquitous internet connectivity, it was clearly very useful to be able to do this. Um, it's, it's, still, it's still useful. Um, but it was originally developed by, by um, Linus Torvalds, the um, head main developer of Linux kernel, uh, in order to do work on Linux to collaborate with, uh, with his peers on that. So there are, there are several other advantages um, to distributed virtual control systems, but which we won't really uh, go into here, but this is quite technical. So having this um, base, sort of some basic ideas about virtual control models, let's now switch to a practical demonstration. Let me just get this up and running, if you give me a minute. So before I even go on to the practical demonstration, I should, uh, should ask is, if there's any questions so far. If, not, if you have any questions, please feel free to uh, just enter them in the chat window. I'll just hopefully pick up on them and try and answer them. Um, if I can't answer them, then uh, David Henty is here as well. Might be able to. Right, so let's get on to doing something practical. Um, yes, I'm going to show us. Show you now, yeah. Um, I'm just uh, setting, switching to uh, a terminal window. So the demonstration that I'll, that I'll give is um, using command line terminal. Oh, that's very small. It's very big for me. It isn't it very big for you, I guess? Um, so I mean, to use these tools, you don't necessarily need to use the command line terminal um, if that's not what you're used to. There are graphical user interfaces or graphical tools that, that, you, that you can use uh, for, for OS X, IO Max, uh, in the Windows, and also in the Linux. But because I think the important thing to understand is uh, really uh, the exact commands uh, that we're using. Uh, I'm doing this all by, uh, by the command line. So hopefully that should be clear. So if I just type, yeah, that's something that's legible. If that's not legible for anyone, please let me know. Okay, so um, the tool that uh, I'm going to use is uh, SVN. So CV CVS is a bit old, so it maybe isn't as <laughs> useful. I mean, it's still used, but S um, Git is very powerful. Uh, and we might, uh, I might show you a bit of that, but it, it's uh, so powerful, in fact, that it's got a really steep learning curve. So uh, SVN seemed like a good idea to really get you started uh, on um, just as an introduction to, to using version control. So what I'm going to do is, um, it is not popular. Yes, uh, SVN, did I say SVN is not popular anymore? CVS isn't popular. The SVN is uh, still relatively widely used, and, and, and it's a good, it's a good, um, um, good example. Yes, Git is extremely popular. Yeah, 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 absolutely. But SVN is a good example, at least, to uh, basically, uh, it's it's a bit simpler, and it gives you less to <clears throat> less rope to hang yourself with in the first instance. So. Um, Seems like a good idea. So I said that uh, SVN 
works with a centralized repository model. So what I've done before the tutorial is I have uh, created a repository somewhere remotely. Um, I've done this via our website. Um, so there are um, various uh, hosting solutions that offer uh, various websites that offer uh, services that, are, that where you can set up a repository and then you can uh, that, that that can serve as your as your uh, remote central repository and then you can work connect to that check out a working copy from it etc. Um, you can also set up your own server if you want but that's a bit more involved. So just as, just for demonstration purposes. So um, the first thing we want to do is to check out a working copy of this remote um, repository. So I'm going to type this SVN, uh, as the name of the command. Um, and then if I, type, if I simply type SVN help, you'll see, see that there are a number of, options, number of commands that you can give. A bit daunting at first. So um, the one to do to check out a working copy of the repository is check out. And then obviously to enter the address. Um, so this is the URL of the website where the repository that I've created lives. Okay, so that's give it command. Right. So it's um, give me some information. Um, so these are this is in a sense a status update. It's telling me what's happened. It's it's downloaded uh, several files. It's checked out revision one. Revision revision control or revision control. It's the same thing. I mean, a revision or a version is just just another word for the same thing. So it's checked out revision one or it's checked out version one um, of the repository. So basically, this is fresh. It's a clean repository. Um, what I mean is there's nothing in there. Now, I said there's nothing in there, but um, in fact, before I did the checkout, I should have just done an ls command to see whether there's anything in the directory, but there wasn't, assuming I was in the right directory anyway. So, so now, now that I've checked out the working copy of the repository, there's a, a folder there called uh, Arch Cookbook. So I can enter the folder. I can look what's inside there. So a bit more detail. Um, so you can see there are three directories, namely branches, tags, and trunk. And there's a, a file, readme file. So I said it's clean, it's a fresh repository, but there's already there's already some stuff, some stuff in there. Uh, this is just um, the branches, tags, and trunk directory directories, these are uh, defaults. These are simply a convention that uh, SVN uses. Um, they are suggested places for storing uh, your code. Um, we won't deal that with branches, but as you, as you can imagine, the, the branches directories where you put uh, basically different branches. The trunk is basically corresponds to the main branch, so it's where you normally start, it's normally where you put, you put your starting point. Tag is something else which we won't get into now. Um, right. So, so there's a log. I mean, first of all, you can see that these, these directories are empty, right? So there's nothing in there, nothing in there, nothing in there. Uh, and the reading file is just some um, some information from from the website saying. Here you go. Here's your here's your enter repository. Enjoy. Um, I said there was a log. That is very useful. Let us have a look at the log. I know it's early stages, but let's have a look anyway. So the command is svn log, and you can see here some information. Format is as follows: it says revision one or version one. Then it says the author name, and the author in this case is um, just uh, this. The, web, well, the website's created the, the repository. Time stamped, which is useful. Um, and the comment, the comment information is simply something saying I've created your uh, default setup for your for your repository. Um, so it's just a boilerplate kind of just a um, bit of introduction. 
So now, um, let's, um, okay, so this is a structure of repository. Let's say that we want to now uh, create a file and then we want to um, add that file to the repository. So in other words, we want to place, we want to create a file and we want to place that version under ver that file under version control. Sorry, the question, I just saw the question, what is R1? R1 here uh, refers to revision one, so version one. Um, so basically this is an entry in the log, this, ent this entire thing. Reminder, oh, sorry, let me just finish what I was saying. This, this, this entire thing highlights is an entry in the log. And as, you, as we put things into the repository and we keep a look at the log, you see that new things, new entries in the commits. The command used to create the repository, well, I didn't, um, I didn't actually create it using the command here. What I did here was I, um, I go up my history of commands and I said SVN checkout. That, that was the command to check out the repository, to check out a working copy of the repository. Now, when I originally created the repository, that was done just in the web browser on the website of this uh, assembler.com. So, if I um, create a file, when I typed HTTPS, yes, that was, the, uh, that was the checkout. So, if I create a file now, um, let's call it, so you'll, you'll notice the name of my name of the um, repository was Archer Cookbook. Now, um, I could, of course, just give examples with code, but uh, to keep things simple and quite intuitive, um, I'm just going to work with um, recipes, because this is, a, this is a cookbook. So that, that's just to simplify things. Um, so I'm going to create um, a template for recipes. I'm going to use my, my favorite text editor, Emacs, and I'm going to create this file. So that's shown for you. So what I'm going to do now is I'm simply going to say, okay, um, I'm going to create a text file here. Print code. So uh, that's going to be my template for, for a recipe. So I'm going to save that and close my text editor. So I've simply created that file in um, in the uh, root directory of my repository directly. I've not, I've not put it in trunk. I've not put it in, as I perhaps should, I should perhaps put it in trunk. I've not put it in branches. I've just put it right, right there. So um, when I look at the log, it's still the same as it was before. Nothing's changed because all we've done now is created a, co we've created a, a file, a new file in our working copy. That file is not yet part of the repository. It just lives only locally here on our machine in this directory in our working copy. Now, there's another command called status, which is very useful. It basically tells you what the status of your working copy is relative to the last uh, known state of the repository. Sorry, I just saw your question. Um, your questions, let me see. I think it's confusing the repository on the thing and the, and the copy here. Yeah, let me see. Um, I think you did, at my terminology, you did create the repository, but I don't know that. Let's see. Uh, no the repository creation checkouts. So there was a previous question that Mike answered. Oh, yes. The, that's right. Yeah. That's right. I mean, what you're seeing in the log, exactly. So this, so this timestamp here, is the time step stamp of when the repository was created on the website uh, last night, right? No, not last night. It's, that's weird. Uh, that date is okay. For some reason, that's not the actual date. Yeah, that doesn't make sense. The log was created uh, yesterday, I think. So that date's just been taken from some default template, some some setting. Um, uh, it's a bit odd anyway because it's not unusual. I mean, yeah, it's just how to. It's been really created. But Mike's right. I mean, that's the, um, uh, the repository creation. The checkouts are indeed not logged. Che the checkout is just something you do. The checkout is not something that you do to change the repository. It's something that you do to uh, uh, bring a working copy of the repository to your machine, to your local machine. 
So I think that's yeah, that's the question. So what I'm doing now is not a repository creation. What I'm doing now is I've checked out the repository and I've created a new file on my on my disk in the same folder as the working copy of the repository. But that file is not yet part of the repository. Now, how does that show? It shows when I type SVN status. Because when I type SVN status, I said status tells you the status of your working copy relative to the uh, last known um, state of the repository. So in other words, relative to the uh, working copy that you, that you checked out at the moment when you checked it out, um, or when it was last updated anyway. So you see here that it's, it's noticed, so basically it says it splits back out, and you see SVN status, it splits back out, question mark, recipe. Okay, so it's, it notices there's a file called recipe, and it says question mark. What does question mark mean? SVN help is very useful. If you just type SVN help, it gives you a list of commands. If you type SVN help status, it'll tell you some stuff. And one of the things it says is that if, um, um, right, the first seven columns in the output of, as, of SVN status are, they, they give a, a state or a little message of interpretation for the file. So question mark means an item is not under version control. So basically, when you type SVN status, and it says question mark recipe, it's saying that I see there's a new file in your working copy called recipe, but I also know that it's not under version control. Uh, in other words, what that means is it's not part of the repository. Now, we said that we want to make it part of the repository. How do we do that? We add it. So we, go, we do SVN add recipe. So it's by God saying, okay, a recipe. Now, A probably stands for add, right? So, you, so now you think, okay, great. My recipe is, file is now part of the repository. So if that's true, then surely it should appear in the log. SVN log. Well, if you look at the log, updating now for you, yeah. If you look at the log, it's still the same as it was. So what's going on? It's not part of uh, the repository. How come? Well, Let's look at help, SVN help, add, that's what actually happened. So, I mean, I'm showing you this because, I mean, this is, this is just really concrete. I mean, if you're trying to use this tool, you're going to have to use the help. That's it. I'm just showing you not magically the right commands, not magically the right thing to do, but I'm showing you um, how to think about, how to go about finding out how to use this tool. Part, um, of course, you should read the manual as well and, and further explanations if you get stuck, but this is this um, help. It's very, very useful. So, if you go to SVN help add, you'll see Let's scroll back up to the beginning bit of it. What it does, what app does, is it says it put, put files and directories under version control, scheduling them for addition to, to the repository. It doesn't actually add them yet. They will, they will be added in the next commit. In other words, adding, I mean, really, <laughs> including a file in the repository is a two-stage process with SVN. You first add, when I say I mean a new file, a file that is not yet part of, not yet in the repository. So there's no version of that file yet in the repository. So the first step is the one I've already taken, which was to do SVN add. And the second step is to now commit, as it described in the help. So commit, as I, as I said in the introduction in the presentation, was um, to really sort of say, okay, this is this is going to go into the repository as a, as a version. Um, so, so, the, so if I type commit, the simply type commit, it'll give me something saying, it's an error message saying, blah, blah, blah. Could commit failed. Could not use external editor to catch log message. Okay. So basically what it's saying here is, normally if you simply type SVN commit, it will start, it will try to um, start a um, text editor. Why? Because it wants you to provide comments. So I said that sometimes these systems force you or strongly encourage you to, to provide comments. You can, I think, save an empty file, I can't remember, but so normally if you set, if you set some, some environment variable like SVN editor um, to be equal to the command for your favorite text editor, then if you type SVN commit, as I did just now, what would happen is that it would fire up your favorite text editor and it would, you would then type something, type some comments, save that file, close the file, and as soon as you close the file, it would actually go ahead in doing the committing. So, um, but instead of using a text editor, you can just give the option dash M followed by a string which actually contains the comments that you want to give. So, for example, uh, here I want to say I added 
uh, recipe template. So this comment, comment is going to go into the log. So you see it's adding recipe, it's transmitting file data. Where is it transmitting it to? It's transmitting it to um, a URL that you saw. It's, it's, it's communicating with the remote server um, and it's um, uh, negotiating with, 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 the, with the repository being kept there and saying, okay, now this is going to be part of the repository. Committed to revision two. So you surely know this should be in the log. Well, that's odd. It's not in the log when I type SVN log. Why is that? Well, the reason for that, and this is something that's very confusing, so it might be confusing when you first use this tool, so I want to point out, is that um, the log is um, stored, it's part of the, the log is part of the repository. Now, the repository has changed remotely on the server, but you've not yet um, uh, retrieved the new, new status of the repository. So to find out what the new status of the repository is, you want to, um, so I want, I, want to prove, I want to prove this to you, first of all, that, that um, let's see, can I do this? Um, I need to change, yes. To prove to you that the file has been added. So if I simply share the browser, might be quite small. Um, so what you should see here, if I increase the font size ridiculously, so this is the website where the remote uh, poster lives. You see here that you can browse the structure of the um, repository. And here you go, recipe is right there. So it's uploaded, it's been uploaded. Just switch back to the command line again. So if I want to, to for this for this to be reflected in the log that I see on my working copy locally here on my machine, I have to actually explicitly uh, request um, to be updated with the, that I, I want to I need to request that my working copy is updated with the current version of the remote repository. So to do that, I say SVN update. Ah, at revision two. So now if I type SVN log, there you go. You see there's a new bit here. Revision two. I still have oh yeah. yeah. So revision two, the author are now at this timestamp, which is now correct. Um, it's a one line comment. Add a recipe template. Okay, so that's all. Um, that's all. That makes all the that makes sense now. So let's um, do a few more things. Uh, let's see. Let's create some. Let's in the same way that we might modify uh, our you know an original script as I talked about. Let's just make some new versions. Let's let's do some software development or in this case cooking. So I want to let's say I make I'll copy my recipe template. And um, I'm going to keep the template because that's going to be my re reusable uh, file. And I'll, um, let's see, yes. So I'll create a new, a new recipe, a specific recipe. And it's called curry. I'll modify the recipe. I'll say, okay, ingredients. First ingredient, onions. So I save that and exit my text editor. So now what's the status of the working copy? Same as it, as it used to be with um, uh, when recipe was first added. It's noted there's a new file called curry. So what I can do is I can say, okay, add, add curry, let's add it. I can commit that file. Um, so it started the curry, curry recipe. That can be my comment. So, for example, if you're talking code, this might be um, uh, start of my project and initialize some uh, some variables, some bubble variables or arrays. It's transmitting the data. It's been added. 
Again, this won't uh, be reflected immediately in the log, but as soon as we update, it will be. Um, let's just create another, let's just do a slight modification again, just so we get the idea of how this would work. Um, first is extremely simple, but it's just a basic idea of having successive versions of a file uh, that, that, you're, that you're developing with some goal in mind. Um, Okay, and now we say status. Now the status, um, of course, it doesn't show question mark. I say of course, I mean, sorry, the status doesn't show question mark curry. That's just M curry. So M stands for modified. So the curry file was already under version control. So it's no longer a question mark. But it, know, it, it notices now that relative to the um, version in the repository, it, uh, it has been changed. Uh, it's been modified. So um, again, I want to commit that. With some meaningful commit message. So I've created another version. So um, one thing I can do, one thing that you can do with these tools is you can see, um, I'll just update local log. So you can see, the, you start to see the history of the, um, of the development. So you can see, it starts to really get a good um, um, feel for what's going on. You can, so you might be used to using, in, in general, in Linux uh, and other systems, you might be used to using a diff command to show the difference between, between files. You can do the same thing uh, with SVN. You can, what you can do is you can um, show the difference between uh, different versions that are in the repository. So for example, if I want to see um, the changes that were made in going from R2, revision 2, to R3, then I'll say SVN diff, dash C option for changes, the changes made in going to, um, going to revision 3. This looks quite complicated at the first sight. The really old saying is that um, relative to version 2, what will happen was that my entire query file was created, actually. That's why there's all these pluses here. So all these lines were inserted. That's perhaps less uh, interesting than to look at SVN diff dash C4. So the changes that were made in going from version 3 to version 4 was that the guard was added. We knew that because of the comments, but of course, if it's much more complicated, if the changes are much more complicated in, in terms of software, then your comments might be something quite succinct, like implemented this new um, uh, algorithm for, for, for FFTs or something like this. And uh, if you do the, the, the SVN diff, then it would show you much more detail. Uh, it would show you exactly which lines changed. So this, this already shows you how the, these tools allow you to um, easily keep track of what changes were made. So say now that um, so this is just one person developing software, or one person uh, cooking up a recipe, making a recipe. Let's say that we've got um, a collaborator. So let's say that we've got David, who wants to um, get in on the action and do some cooking as well. So he says, OK, I know that there's a, um, there's a cookbook there that, that Arne is working on. I want to see what, what, he's, what recipes he's creating. So he has to check out the same, um, but right now he has nothing, right? So this directory. Oh, yes, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yes, yes, yes. So that's, uh, okay. Uh, so he's got nothing. So he needs to check out a working copy of his repository. So if we just go back to, 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 to my window, uh, um, well, let me just turn here. Let's uh, grab here. Let's grab from. Um, no, that's not the right one. OK, 
Okay. So, they were simply doing the same thing as I did when I originally checked out the repository. Of course, he doesn't get the fresh, clean repository. He gets the repository as it is now, complete with all the changes that I made. So he's checked out revision four. So that, that is the current revision. So if I enter the directory, you can see what's there. The curry recipe is there, and it's got onions and garlic in it. Now, if I go back, meanwhile, I'm still I'm still working on this. And so I'll take give it a second to synchronize. So I'm still working on the curry, and um, I'll add uh, some chili, save that, and I'll uh, add some heat. Right, so I've added the chili. Then David, um, he's he's not started cooking yet, and he says, "Oh, before I start cooking, let me check. Let me let me check that Arno's not made any changes. Actually, let me check I'm up to date with the repository." So he says, "SPN update." Ah, right, something has changed. Then I get a, get a message saying, "Okay, the file of curry has been updated. So it's, a, it's now it's now a new version, which is which is now in David's working copy as well. So he's he's synchronized. So that's nice." Um, now David starts wanting to cook as well, so uh, he says, "Okay, well I've got an idea. Why don't I add? Oops, sorry. Why don't I add some? Um, why don't I add some ginger? Now he saves that, and um, before so he's he's worried. He's adding that, and meanwhile I'm also I'm also editing the file, right? So I'm saying I don't, I'm not thinking of ginger." Uh, I think we think of cumin seeds. Right. Now, what's so? I've made a change. So say that um, I say that David gets in there first. He says, "Okay, this this looks like a good recipe. I'm, I think this should be part of the repository. Uh, this is great. I'm going to commit this." Um, uh, So David is now committing to the repository. Now, if I seconds later, well, okay, you say really. If I if I try to then um, also uh, commit, then I get an error. So what it says is that it's trying to transfer the file to the server, but it's saying that uh, actually this file is out of date. What file? The local file on your machine. So the local curry file in your working copy, this one here, is out of date. It's out of date with respect to the, the repository. Just to be clear here. So it's preventing me from committing my change in curry. Um, as a result of there being a more up-to-date version of the file in, in the repository. Today it's purely in terms of timestamp. So Dave got the first. So what I need to do, well, to do this, uh, some, somehow we need to, so this is a conflict essentially. Um, it, we've got two different versions of these files and we either need to decide that, okay, this is the one which they're going to diverge We're going to have two files or we're going to retain the same file but we need to somehow integrate these changes. Now, that branching into two files, that, that might amount to, might be, be, be where branching comes in, but we won't discuss that here. Uh, if we want to uh, resolve this conflict, then in SVN, what we do is that um, I, the person, the collaborator, the author who's encountering the um, out of date error, requests, explicitly requests an update. So, fine, the repository is ahead. Well, then give me the state of the repository and I'll see what I can do. So, I try that. And then it just confirms there's a conflict in that file. And it gives me various options. Now, what do these options mean? A bit cryptic, so I type S for show all options. And there you get the options. So um, you can um, uh, 
postpone, leave it for now, and what that does is actually we'll do that because that's quite nice. Because postponing means that you get what it leaves you with um, uh, several files in your repository showing the uh, older version, the newer version, and your own version. I.e., it shows you the well, we'll, we'll see. It shows you the previous version that was in the repository. It shows you the new version that David added, and it shows you your current working copy. And then you have to um, explicitly decide which one uh, is going to constitute the next version that you're trying to commit. You can also um, uh, immediately do so, so immediately deal with resolving the conflict now by saying E for edit, which fires up your favorite text editor, because, but as I haven't set that uh, editor, I haven't chosen that, I'm not going to do that, because it'll just give me, a fill, uh, give me an error message. Um, there are some proposed um, changes um, so we can display okay we can display the conflict by typing DC we can also we can also simply accept we can also ditch uh, my proposed version um, by saying TF there's full so then forget about what I was trying to do just just uh, their version is the way to go or the other way around just saying forget about bulldoze over their version and keep mine but the more complicated case is uh, resolve actually resolve the conflict if I type DC to display the conflict, you'll see it's clearly delineated here that I have inserted cumulancies, um, whereas uh, the other author, David, has um, chosen for ginger. So I still have the options now. I'm going to say postpone just for now. Now, what's happened is it's just updated to revision six, which is the same revision that David was at. So what's happened now is that um, David's version is now also present in my working copy here. So if I type ls, so forget about these files, right? With the tilde at the end, the stuff that Emacs always spits out. So just just so that we're clear about that. So now there's there's various three, well, it's actually four versions of the curry file. Um, Curry.r5 was the last, uh, was, a, was the previous um, version in the repository. Curry r6 is a version that David um, successfully committed. Oh. Uh, as we see, um, r5 was the previous version. Curry.mine is the one that I'm trying to commit. And simply, curry itself is the annotated uh, copy. As we, the same thing we just saw when we typed uh, DC for display conflict. So it's the version that has the specific place in the file where there is a difference in these two versions annotated. So we have to now explicitly choose to resolve how to resolve this. We can do that by using the command svn resolve. But then we need to specify the file name that we're actually going to accept as the resolved, um, as that we're going to commit to the repository as the version of the file that resolves the conflict. But I don't simply want to accept. Um, so, so, let's, so let's say that I want to somehow um, uh, neither accept my version unambiguously, or not, and, and nor do I want to simply accept David's. But I want to edit the third file. I want to edit this curry file that has the differences annotated into a state where I'm happy with it. So maybe I just talk to David and say, what do you think? I, I think we should actually include both ingredients. So both, if you can software, both parts of our algorithm, for example, or both, both features that we're integrating should be, should be part of this. So I'm going to allow both of them. So I've edited this file. I've, I've removed the annotation, which is just some, just some text being inserted by SVN. Save that. Exit. Um, and then I'm going to say SVN resolve. And then um, there's, um, I guess you would like to say SVN, simply SVN resolve the name of the file, but there's a bit of extra hoop that you have to jump through, which is to give an option saying accept, and it tells, it tells SVN uh, where this copy that you're, um, that you're accepting as the conflict resolution uh, comes from. So, so choice here is working. So certain keywords in the working um, repository, 
Um, these are standard set of keywords. This is just something that um, it's often to say this is just something that's easy. SVN cleanup. SVN cleanup. Did I mention SVN cleanup? It's a question. Um, but you mentioned it. Um, not sure. Ah. Okay. All right. So um, just to, just to show you what I mean by this, let's accept as we can help resolve. I look at the help file. I can see that resolve conflicts on working copy files or directories, and there are different accept options, namely. Base working, mind conflict, there's conflict, mindful, there's full. This is just a bit of additional information, but it's, but it's required. In this case, I'm using a copy that doesn't have a copy of the files from a working copy. This is not, not something terribly um, interesting right now. So I'm going to say SVN resolve dash as accept working, and then I give the name of the file, which I'm going to accept as the um, resolve version. Right. What is the status then? Okay, so it says it's modified. So let's see if I can then um, commit. So that's happy now. So it's happy to commit that file. So that, that version supersedes the um, Davis version. Now it's version seven. So just update to get the latest log file. Let's see it here. Log. So um, let's see. There is so there's something that we did early on when we started creating this repository. So I just started creating these 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 files, uh, recipe and curry, straight in the in the root directory. I didn't go into into the trunk directory. So I should probably do that. I should probably um, at least I should put it's conventional to put maybe something like recipe, which could be your template or your main um, branch, say, development into the trunk folder. So I might be tempted to say, okay, simply move recipe into trunk. That seems like a reasonable thing to do, doesn't it? Um, so what does the status say then? It's a bit confused. So what it notes is that, is that there is a new file in the trunk directory called recipe, which is not yet under version control, hence a question mark. But there's an exclamation mark for uh, recipe itself, namely the copy that's um, well that it, that it thinks should be here probably in this in in the root directory. So if we look at SPN help. Uh, status question mark, uh, exclamation mark means that we go item is missing. So basically, it's noticed that a file which was under version control is missing. It's it's no longer there, which means that it's been removed by non SVN command because there is actually a specific SVN command called SVN move. And that informs the repository, tells the repository that you want that file to be moved from one place in the repository to another place in the repository. So what we can do is we can we can go back and say, okay, I want to undo that, undo what I've just done. The key the, the command that you can use there is SVN revert. What that does is help indicate it brings us back to pristine working copy file of, of, of the file um, of the path that you specify. So you use it by saying revert and then specifying the path. So if you don't need to note, you don't need to, to do that. You don't need to um, check the state of the repository. It just brings you back to the latest, latest um, um, updated version of the working copy. So I do SVN revert um, dot for the current directory. Can I do SVN status? Ah, good. So, so the reason that's not changed anything is because I actually need to um, revert dash R, which stands for recursively. So it goes into the 
um, subdirect into the trunk sub subdirectory. And then it confirms that it's, uh, that it's a reverted recipe. In other words, um, what it's done is, so recipe, so, sorry, I just, <laughs> if you look in the root directory, recipe is there again. So what it's done is it's uh, put recipe back. Now it's not moved it from trunk to the, to the directory. It's not literally done the inverse of what I did, but it's just uh, gotten everything that is under version control back to what was the latest state when we last updated our working copy. It's not, it's not a deleted the version in, um, in trunk. You can see that's still there. It's not done that because it's not in a, in a way uh, has permission to that. It's not that, that file is just, it's not under version control. It's just a new file that's, it's a file that appeared, uh, but you've not yet said that it should be tracking that. So I'm free to do with that file what I want. So I, I'll just delete that. See that it's actually done. And I'll do the right thing, which is to say SVN move uh, recipe to trunk. So the status then is that recipe is deleted from the root directory and is added to the trunk directory. So I can click that. Okay. So that's a bit of insight into um, starting to use SVN. So now let's have a look at uh, using Git. Yeah, it should be. Uh, yeah, my. Yeah, I could just. I mean, Git might be quite a quite quick. Uh, just to get this. Yeah, that's yeah, got a local repository yeah. rather than remote repository. So just say we'll, we'll do we'll do we won't do much with Git, but we'll just um, do a little bit so that you basically understand in practice if you use Git or something simpler than Git, namely Mercurial, which I highly recommend. <laughs> Not having used it myself, but it's simpler than Git, so it should be probably be good. Um, so okay, well, what I'll, what I'll do is show you something about about how Git works um, that highlights the difference between the model of repositories that SVN and Git use, namely centralized in this case for SVN versus distributed in Git's case. So I'm going to um, open up a new terminal window. Making the font larger. Um, okay. So I'm in a directory where, where there's nothing there. And so let's so let's say I want to do the same thing that I've just done. I mean this repository that I that I uh, was dealing with now is the Archer Cookbook. It was an SVN repository. It was remotely hosted on the website, on the Assembler website. I checked out a working copy that was working with that and collaborating with, using it to collaborate, etc. Now, if I want to do something similar but then using Git, then um, right away the difference is that I don't have to have a pre existing remote repository. I can create the repository right here on my own machine. So, the way to do that. Um, is to first of all just create the directory where you want the repository to live. So I'll call it Archer Cookbook. I'll go into that directory and I'll type the command is git init. It is for initialize. So it says it's initialized an empty git repository in the current directory. Well, actually, uh, it's initialized it in a subfolder of this current directory called dot git. So I simply type ls, you'll see that this directory is entirely empty, but it's, there's some hidden files there which are in the .git directory, and those are what actually contain all the all the, um, the entire repository. Well, they contain yes, they contain the repository. That's where the repository is stored essentially. So it, with git, if you type well, if you type ls, you'll see always your working copy. At the moment, your working copy has nothing in it. If you type ls dot get, then you'll see everything in the repository, including all the uh, you're looking under the hood, basically. The same thing um, exists in, in Git in S for SVN. From here, back in my SVN repository, if I type ls dot SVN, you'll see that there's um, all the information under the hood there. This is where where the working copy um, of the repository is stored. 
So, I mean, it's, it's kind of before I even go on with Git, I mean, the thing is, so you can see already the benefits that that, that, that version control systems have, but what it allows you to do is suddenly you get this extra dimension, you get this, uh, you get this sort of just magical, well, magical, but this is a really convenient tool on your machine, which allows you to just, it's like a time travel machine, you just go back to whatever uh, version in, in the past you've committed, um, and suddenly you, so you, you can check out, um, check out that version, which we didn't actually do with SVN. So, we're constantly adding new versions. What you can do is you can type SVN checkout, um, and then uh, you, can, you can check out the say revision one or two, and you can start working with with that again, and uh, use that as a basis for your major commits. That's that's really the power of version control. So um, with Git, we've uh, initialized this entry repository. And now git log well, it shows nothing, you can get an error, but git also has a command called status, gives us some information, it says on branch master. Branches play uh, a more important role in, in SVN, oh, sorry, in git than in SVN. In SVN, um, there is, as you saw there, we could put our files essentially anywhere in the repository and, and, and choose to um, Anywhere in the structure, in the file structure, and choose to to track them, um, and you can create branches in, in using SVN, but in Git they're much more implicit in the, in in the working model. So there's right now there's, it just says there's nothing nothing to commit. So if I want to create so I'll create a file, I'll like a file, uh, I won't copy because I just create a file. Same thing. Whatever it is. Uh, okay, so the file files are there. So to SVN, I say git add, git add recipe. So does that mean that it's not part of the repository? No, if I type, uh, similarly to SVN, it's not immediately part of the repository. When I type, S, when I type git status, it gives me some information. It says, the same way that, that SVN said question mark, um, well, if, uh, yeah. So in, this, if I, in the same way that, that um, uh, SVN said, I'm going, to, I'm going to add the file that you've asked me to add, but I've not, I've not added it to the repository yet. It's scheduled to add. This has now been scheduled to add, scheduled to commit to the repository. So if I want to commit this new file, it says you changes to be committed, new file recipe. I want to commit that file. I type git commit. Dash M, you see the syntax is, is similar, it's very convenient. Um, add a recipe template. Now it gives me some, some information back, the information that's been added. Now, this is where you can see that when you look at the Git log as opposed to the SVN log, you immediately see this change. I mean, the reason for this is because we're not having to synchronize with the remote repository. We are putting this into the repository right here on the machine. So there's no, there's no, there's no, you don't need to synchronize with a remote repository. Um, so that's probably a good. So if you want, so you may, you may have heard of um, pushing and pulling. If you want to synchronize with a remote repository, you can, and that's of course a very common working practice with Git. This is done um, by setting some switches that, that by setting some some uh, toggles in files stored under .git um, that tell git where to push your repository to. So in other words, you can tell git, when you say git push, Right now, it won't be happy to do so because it says there's no configured push destination. But in principle, I can configure a push destination like a remote URL, similar to uh, the assembler website, some other phone. Uh, but in this case, probably GitHub, which is a very, very um, much used website, which I'll talk about. Um, and you can then synchronize with the remote repository and do many of the same things and, and, and many more, more things as well as I was just discussing doing with SVN to collaborate. So hopefully that's giving you a bit of an initial uh, impression of how, how you actually concretely use these tools. Now, just um, 
end with a quick summary and um, give us some suggestions for how you might like to take this up and use this yourself. So um, which version control, so if, if you're interested in using version control, and I hope that I've convinced you that it's, that it's definitely worthwhile, that not only if you're collaborating with other people, but also just to keep track of your own, keep track of your own uh, work, uh, and possibly as a, as a way to, to back things up, as a, as a way of easily uh, spreading your, replicating your, your configuration files or your code on different systems, uh, including your laptop, a machine like Archer, elsewhere. So it seems like a really good, really good thing to use. So which version control system tool should you use? If you're joining an existing project, if you're working with, um, with collaborators, um, then the, the easy answer is whatever is already being used. Because if there's an, if there's an established working flow, it's going to be much more inertia to uh, change that um, than simply um, go along with what's already established, uh, at least initially. So it, once you start out using a particular version control, tool, you can, uh, there are many conversion tools that allow you to convert, say, an SVN repository to a newer, more popular uh, SVN model like uh, Git or Material. For your own development work, um, it really depends on, 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 on what you're doing. Um, so you can, see, you can see that Git is nice, because it is, well, any distributed version control system like Git uh, is nice because it means that you don't have to work with a remote repository. Um, you don't have to set anything like that up. It's in a way simpler to initialize, um, and you can work um, you can work remotely without uh, committing things, without, without needing to be online. You can work on the go independently. And actually, um, Git is extremely powerful. It allows you to do uh, many things. And uh, GitHub, which you may have heard of, but which is distinct from Git, um, is, a, is a website that both hosts, uh, well, it, it allows you to host these remote repositories and um, in fact, use them for collaboration, but it has a whole host of other features. So what it allows you to do is um, to basically raise, uh, like, like, a, like a, it's like a discussion platform where you can raise issues addressing particular versions of software, either your own or other people's or collaborators, and that can then be linked in with um, changes that are being made in response to these issues being raised, and this will be tracked. So develop, it's very good for tracking development and for um, uh, collaborating with other people. And that's actually one of the reasons why, some of the reasons why Git is so popular, even though Git has a very, very steep learning curve, it's very popular because GitHub is very popular, because Git, GitHub is very nice. Um, so you might be tempted to, to use GitHub and therefore Git for that reason. Um, however, as I said, Git does have a very steep learning curve. In particular, you can it requires a lot of it has a lot of quirky jargon, there's a lot of um, specific jargon that if you don't know exactly what you're doing, you can easily um, shoot yourself in the foot and basically end up creating basically creating a very messy repository or unmaintainable um, and, and, and uh, you can also even even end up losing losing data, but you just need to. Um, it's possible to use it and to just use it in a simple way, and that's maybe what you should try to do. But if that's the case, then I would actually suggest that you try, if this is your first time using um, a particular distributed version control systems, to try using Mercurial, because Mercurial uh, is meant to be quite similar to uh, to Git, often much of the same functionality, um, but it's much simpler to use and. E easier, well, less likely to, for you to shoot yourself in the food basically. So uh, there are some useful links here. Obviously, that, that's copy paste is not very useful. But this presentation will go up on the Archer website. Uh, and I might include some, some additional links that will help you get started. And there is a lot of material out there um, about uh, version control systems in general, but um, Syntax. I mean, this the first link here is the, actually the, the manual for is actually the manual for SVN. Um, there are interactive tutorials that you can find. So I might put some more of these links up. 
Um, so I hope that you found this useful. It's really, it was really meant as a very basic introduction so that you get these ideas clearly, clearly in your head so that before uh, terminal log to upload, yes, I will, yes, I will not dispose of my terminal log. Uh, might be a bit messy, but I'll uh, keep it and, um, and upload, yes. So basically what I wanted to do is I wanted to, 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 stay, quite, to stay quite simple, but to really make sure you have a clear, clear idea of um, these basic concepts so that when you get to the syntax, when you get to the manual pages, when you get to help files or tutorial, other tutorials, um, that you're, you're not at a loss as to what the basic underlying model is. Question here from Alexa, is it possible to run Git running on a server, each in a cluster with the Git GUI running on a machine? Yeah, I think it's, I mean, it's, people tend to just simply use GitHub, but it should definitely be possible to, to, to um, um, use, yeah, you can set up a, a, a server uh, to run, uh, to host uh, a Git repository and access it using a GUI on your local machine. Whether that's possible on, on Arch, I don't know because uh, I'm not aware of specific requirements in terms of open ports or anything like that. Um, so that typically people just tend to use GitHub because it's easy. Um, but um, yes, if you want to not be forced into, for example, having having your code public or not, not want to pay, you simply have your own server and you want to control it, uh, then it should be possible to do. Yeah, absolutely. And in fact, I think, um, no, no, I was going to say Linus Torvalds himself um, is somewhat, have somewhat despairing, I think, of, of um, people thinking that Git is equivalent to GitHub, so in which it's not. So you should be able to use um, Git itself. I can, try, I can try and find some information about this and include it um, as an addendum, say, to the, uh, to the slides on the website when I put this up on the website. So just wondering if there are any more questions. So, C so CVS is a very, CVS and SVN are, are more likely than not already uh, installed in your system. Uh, not if you're using Windows, I think. But there are, as I said, there's graphical user interfaces. I think for Windows it's called uh, Tortoise um, SVN is one of them. Um, so there are convenient graphical interfaces that what did okay so they use use and they obscure somewhat the obscure sometimes the exact commands that are that are being used which can be nice but also lead to um, means that you don't understand necessarily what uh, how to how to fix things uh, or actually how to script things if you want to actually use the actual commands. Well, I should say that um, so yes, thank you very much for attending anyway. And uh, if you have uh, any feedback, please do leave it at the, on the website, the Archer website, at um, following URL. Uh, it should also just be accessible. I think if you, if you go to the Archer website, you'll get upcoming courses, or in this case, I guess, for just the virtual tutorial section of the website and uh, under training. And uh, you click on this particular look under past tutorials, past virtual tutorials, and you click on the, I think there's, there's a feedback link included there. So that would be much appreciated. Yeah. Thanks, Claire. Okay. Any more questions at all? Okay, so um, thanks very much. Please feel free to um, to uh, either email me. Uh, you see the email addresses on my email addresses on the on the slides, um, which will be online or uh, or the Archer help desk. But you can email me directly if you have any questions about about this material. And the slides and recording should be available for you to review. Um, in perhaps a few days' time or next week sometime. Okay. Call it a session. Yeah, that's okay. Fine. Okay, thanks everyone.
Bye-bye.